Um, so our next presentation is being put on by uh, Michael Formicelli and Tom Algar. Uh, they are from the New York State Agriculture and Markets Division. Um, and this is a very crucial presentation, but something that everyone I'm sure is hearing a little bit about and will continue to hear about. It is um, Spotted Lanternfly, Current Status and Research Activity in the Northeast. So uh, Michael is a horticulture inspector with the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. His position responsibilities include the identification of invasive pests and the injury caused by these pests. Uh, Mike also produces Asian Longhorn Beetle Training Seminars on location for interested parties and performs regulatory inspections. Uh, he has been employed with the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets since 2002 and received his bachelor's in biology from Oberlin College. And Tom is an invasive species coordinator for the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets with over 20 years of public service between federal and state positions dealing with invasive plant pests. Prior to his public service, he worked in various landscape construction, garden center, and greenhouse positions. Tom holds an associate's degree in ornamental horticulture from Farmingdale State University, a bachelor's of science from Empire State College, where he studied environmental biology, and a, and a master's of science degree from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where he studied environmental science. So I will send it over to you guys. Um, share, you can share your screen and love to hear you start. Great. Um, I'm just gonna do one quick correction. I think I may have accidentally sent you an older bio. Um, I'm not doing the Asian longhorn beetle trainings anymore. Oh. I just wanna make that clear. Sorry about that. No uh, Asian longhorn beetle in the New York City area uh, has been eradicated and that's my work area for that. So that, that um, it was good news that that fell off my table. Definitely. <laughs> okay, just a moment while I figure this out. I don't use Zoom very much. <laughs> so, do. I think it's working. Can everyone see that? Yes. yes. Fantastic. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, so the, we're going to start off the uh, spotted lanternfly update uh, with spotted lanternfly, and then we're going to go through some of the more invasives and um, other pest issues and some of the legal issues that uh, surround the nurseries in regard to this <clears throat> and some other pests. <laughs> So uh, I'm Michael Formicelli, horticultural inspector with in New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. I'm responsible for primarily for Westchester County. And um, I also get sent other places depending on need. And I'm here with Tom Algar. Tom, do you want to introduce yourself again <laughs> real quick? Sure. I, I'm the invasive species coordinator with New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Uh, I cover the entire state. Um, I, I work very closely with all the prisms. The other state agencies in the uh, Invasive Species Council and the Invasive Species Advisory Committee. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, all right, so we have a number of response part partners to Spotted Lanternfly. Uh, Spotted Lanternfly has been confirmed in New York State, as you will see, and we'll show you some of the areas where we found it. Later on, we're in partnership with Department of Environmental Conservation, the state parks. Uh, Recreation and Historic Preservation, New York City Department of Environmental Protection, uh, the USDA APHIS um, Plant Protection and Quarantine, Lower Hudson Prisms, and New York State Department of Transportation, New York State Natural Heritage Program, and we'll be adding to this list actually as we go along. Uh, we also work with Cornell Extension, and uh, we will be adding the New York City Housing Authority, I believe, uh, later today. <clears throat> So what's the issue here? Spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper native to China and Southeast Asia. It was discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014 uh, in a 
more or less rural area of Pennsylvania. It spread from there into the forests and eventually into the more urban areas as well. And from Pennsylvania, it spread to other states like New Jersey and New York, unfortunately. The mouthparts feed on sap more than, of more than 70 plant species. This host list for this is so huge, actually. Um, uh, you can pretty much consider most shade trees to, to be a host, more or less, at least as far as feeding goes. We believe that they prefer Tree of Heaven uh, or Ilanthus to feed on. Uh, there was some thought for a while that it was necessary for the reproduction. We're not sure about that anymore. We've been finding egg masses on a variety of species, including evergreens, as well as other shade trees, um, oaks, pines. Uh, basically, at this point, we consider, as far as uh, egg laying goes, all trees to be hosts for eggs. The threat of this insect is that they will attack grapes, apples, hops, uh, maples, walnuts, sumac, oaks, and pines. The main concern uh, economically for the state is the grapes, uh, hops, and apples, of course. These are three major uh, crops that support major industries in New York State, so the, the economic threat is actually quite large. So uh, the impacts of this insect, uh, they feed on stress plants, making them vulnerable, feed on and stress the plants, making them vulnerable to disease and attacks from other insects. They also secrete honeydew, uh, that's the stuff coming out the back end, which attracts sooty mold that can interfere with the plant's photosynthesis and negatively affect the growth of fruit yield. Uh, this insect's primary uh, threat to farmers is that it will affect the, the fruiting of plants and affect the harvest. It can reduce or uh, virtually eliminate a, a profit that way. In more suburban and urban areas, it affects, affects the quality of life. It, it hinders outdoor activities. Can't really stress this enough. The spy lantern fly does congregate in large numbers and all of those insects are raining honeydew. So if you can imagine thousands of insects in a tree raining honeydew down, uh, no one's really gonna wanna be underneath that tree. And you can imagine that being your clients' backyards, front yards, et cetera. They'll also rain that honeydew down on vehicles and other items outside, which then attracts the sooty mold. So if you can imagine a car getting covered in honeydew and then molding, that'll give you an idea of some of the impact of this insect in a more urban setting. So the life cycle, I uh, will take it from the eggs are laid uh, on the tree of heaven, preferably, but like we've talked about, they're, they're laid on a wide variety of species. Uh, any smooth bark tree will do. We also see them on rough surfaces, which you'll see later. Uh, so really anywhere. They'll also lay them on whatever happens to be nearby. We've seen it on stone, on vehicles, uh, underneath rail ties. It's, it's really quite remarkable that this insect's very, uh, very not choosy <laughs> uh, where it comes to laying its eggs. The adults hatch, the nymphs um, come out in April to early May. You can see they're black and white when that first happens. Then, uh, sorry, one second, I just gotta minimize. Oh, it's not, there we go. <clears throat> the nymphs have four instars and develop red spots in addition to the white spots as we go throughout the spring into the summer. And then heading from about midsummer into the fall, uh, really till the first, um, well, till the frost is the adults. One of the concerns I've had since learning about this insect is that the, the insect looks like a pretty butterfly. And I've had some concern that residents may see it and say, oh, what a pretty insect and not report it. Uh, unfortunately, looks are deceiving. This insect, as we've talked about, is highly destructive and needs to get reported as soon as possible. Here, this gives you a, more of a layout throughout the year of when things are present. You can see the eggs are present from September through June, rolling into the next year. The instars, uh, one through three, as we talked about, is from April through, sorry, sorry April through July. Fourth instar, that's that uh, red, white, and black instar, August through September. And the adults uh, also are present from August until they get killed off by the frost. We've uh, found them to be present and, and lethargic, but still alive in late November and early December already. So that 
uh, will give you an idea of how cold resistant they are. So we've been surveying for this insect uh, for a few years now, actually, and then intensively recently since its, its confirmation in New York State. You can see the pictures on the left of the, the nymphs. I mentioned that these eggs can be laid on pretty much any surface. Uh, they prefer to lay the eggs underneath. So if you are scouting for this, you want to look underneath branches when you look up into the tree, uh, underneath any kind of sheltered part of the tree trunks, including below knots and below the junctions with the branches. When you're surveying objects, you have to look underneath things. You can see in the middle here the railroad tie where they, they have the egg there. Um, Orangeburg in New York is one of the areas where this insect is present, and we've seen them in the, the cracks of walls and things like that. So it, it's a very, it's an, uh, it's an insect that hides its eggs um, very well and tries to, to get them out of, the, uh, out of the exposure from the elements. That's something to keep in mind when you're looking. On the far right here, you can see the slide of them on a tree and you can just see how many kind of crowd up onto the, the tree at once there. So part of the, the way we look for this, we do visual surveys, but we also set traps. Trap on the left is the bag trap. Uh, we also call it a circle trap. It's essentially just a net funnel that funnels into a bag like that. The trap gives us an idea not only of whether or not the insect is present, but it gives us something of an idea of uh, the population size. The more spy lanternflies are in the area, the more that bag is going to fill up over time. The trap on the right is the bug barrier trap. It's essentially flypaper, uh, but it's translucent. And we have the sticky side on the inside. Uh, you can see the construction of this trap is we have a, a cotton layer that holds the sticky paper away from the bark. And then there's a space on, underneath when the insect crawls up, it uh, gets stuck in there. Those are good for pure detection. We don't really think they give us much of an idea of the population in an area, unlike the, the bag trap on the left. But when we're scouting an area to see if they've spread there, it's, it's a useful detection tool. The other thing is that with this trap, you can check it very easily. Um, actually, with both of them, you can check them very easily because you just walk up to it and look to see if uh, the spot lantern fly is present or not. Oh, um, I'm going to mention this too. So the bug barrier traps on the, the right side, uh, they're constructed that way to prevent trapping of unwanted targets like uh, birds and so forth. Uh, because this, the sticky side is on the inside. So really only, only things that crawl up the trunk are going to get caught in that. So the eggs, you can see in the center of this slide here is an egg mass. You can see how well they do blend in with the bark there. Uh, they can be quite hard to see, especially on a day where it's even just a little bit cloudy. And it takes a while for the eyes to get used to finding them. Uh, you can see there's the, the highlight there of the egg mass on that, on that tree. They will also lay their eggs underneath the bark, any place where the bark has been cracked and they can get in there. Again, the, the female sort of target areas where they can keep the eggs outside of the element, uh, away from the elements rather. So you can see we've peeled a bit of bark there on the left and underneath are the fresh egg masses. On the right hand side, you can see a fresh egg mass, which is the, the lighter colored one and a uh, older egg mass is sort of right to the left of it. And you can see again, it's blending in very well with the bark. Again, they, they lay their eggs in areas that are, are sheltered. So when scouting, you've got sort of um, your eye should be drawn to these areas to, to look for them. They also, uh, as I've mentioned, lay their eggs on any rough surface. So on the, the far left, you can see the adult there compared to the covered egg mass and uncovered eggs. With this insect, it doesn't always cover the eggs perfectly, and sometimes it barely covers them at all. So you can see that, that middle photo there, you have the covering on the right and then the, the rows of eggs on the left. On the far right, we see egg masses on a rusty tire on the ground there. Uh, and again, they lay their eggs on virtually anything. Can't stress that enough. 
what are the other challenges with this insect and how we think it, uh, or at least part of how it makes big jumps between areas is that they will lay their eggs on vehicles and they will hitchhike on vehicles as well. You can see on the left-hand side, the eggs there on that rusty surface underneath um, the uh, payload area of a truck. And on the right-hand side, you can see in the grill that there are some spotted lanternflies there sort of in the middle towards the bottom. We have had residents uh, go shopping in areas where spotted lanternfly is known to be and bring the insects back uh, on their vehicles and some of these in their vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, that is a vector that gets around. So as you're going around to your client's properties, it kind of doesn't matter if you know that you're near a spotted lanternfly area or not, you should still have a, a look around because it could have been transported there through human means. Here again is a, another example of where they lay their eggs. It's a rusty 50 gallon drum. You can see, even though this, this object is not a tree, they're still trying to lay those eggs underneath the sheltered areas. So you can see them beneath the rims a lot there, especially at the bottom. You have that one that's sort of just on it in the middle. And then there's a few uh, underneath the upper rim there. So here is the map the, of the Northeast with the spotted lanternfly detections by county. You can see how far it's spread. It's, it's gotten all the way into Ohio already, down into Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, and New York and Connecticut. So Orangeburg, New York, uh, December of 2020, we identified 246 egg masses and destroyed them. We've also saw 50 plus by lanternfly adults in that area. Uh, many more adults were unreachable. And we do believe that there are likely egg masses higher up in the trees that we may have missed. Uh, so we're gonna continue to survey that area and check and attempt to control the population as much as possible. And you see the, the map that you're looking at there, those grids are US geological survey grids that we're using to target our surveys. Uh, green dots are negative trees that were checked and the red dots are where we found positive finds. That bullseye area is uh, the targeted survey area. We, we have different um, sort of different targets by range out from where the infestation is. So the, the closest range we survey 100% and then we drop that off a little bit as we go out and go out again like that. Uh, we do that uh, you know, to, to of course be more efficient with our surveys. And when we find a, a new finding, you know, we assess the situation and uh, we often go to 100% around the new findings as well. 100% uh, trees checked, I should say. Ithaca in New York was also found to have spotted lanternfly egg masses in December of 2020 and 11 adults were found there. The, the squares here and, and the dots are actually, it's a mix of data between us and I believe that's the USDA's data also. So we just mark who found what by different shapes, but it's, the color coding is the same meaning. Slotsburg, we had some positive finds right around the truck rest stop there. Uh, we, at this time, we don't believe it's gone very far off of that, but it's sort of easy to, to figure out how it got in there. Again, it's a, a rest stop for interstate trucking. So Westchester County, we're checking intensively along the Connecticut state line because uh, I'm not sure you can see the pointer when I move it here, but this, this area right across in Connecticut and um, Greenwich, Connecticut reported to us that uh, at least 10 adults were found over the summer. So we're, we're watching that line very, very carefully. And they were found um, right across King Street there, right into Connecticut. I believe Connecticut also had another find in New Canaan. I don't know too much about that, but that's another part of the border that we're growing concerned about. The good news is so far, so good. We haven't found any spy lantern fly or egg masses on the, on the Westchester side of that border, but we are going to swing back through and recheck it soon. Port Jervis is another area where we've had detections. Uh, one of them is right at the entrance of the state park there that's on the right side of the map. Uh, we also had some detections right with the New York Pennsylvania border, that's the left side there. And then we had a, 
and egg mass kind of in the middle between them. And you can see there in December, as of December, we had one spider lanternfly nymph detected, nine adults and three egg masses. Long Island City in Queens, New York has also had detections. Uh, there were two adults detected uh, in and around Gantry Plaza State Park. And we have our first egg mass in that area found just this month. Staten Island, uh, this was the first confirmation in New York State. And as you can see, there were many, many, many detections in Staten Island. The, we also had some adult detections in Brooklyn and Southern Queens there. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no egg masses detected yet in Brooklyn. Uh, we are uh, continuing to survey those areas, but of course, as everyone knows, we have the COVID-19 situation go, going on. And actually for all areas in the state, um, we try to avoid exposing surveyors to areas that have high COVID-19 rates. So that kind of affects the scheduling of our survey. Uh, but when the rates do drop, uh, we do send surveyors back in. To report sightings of spotted lanternfly in New York State, you can go to the spotted lanternfly email there at spottedlanternfly at agriculture.ny.gov. Uh, we will repeat some of this information as we get to other invasives and uh, tell you how to report them in, in the different ways. I should mention too that when you do report them, a picture is pre preferred. If you can capture the insect, like in a Ziploc bag or something like that, we'll come pick it up. Uh, but at, at a minimum, uh, we like to have a picture. If you can't get a picture or, or a sample, that's okay. Just um, you can just put in the report what you saw. Like I think I saw a spotted lantern fly, you know, here and there. Uh, but we respond first to to uh, reports that have samples and, and pictures. So it's more more of a concrete thing, and that's just a time management issue for us. I think I fouled you up there, Mike. Sorry. I, yep. <laughs> sorry. No problem. I have two more slides. <laughs> Problem. Let me, I'm just going to grab it back. My apologies to everyone, especially my words. Okay. Let's... I thought I was being time efficient. <laughs> no worries. There. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to transition over to the other invasives uh, that affect nurseries and plants in the area. So of course, this is our, our unfortunately old friend boxwood blight. This is what it looks like. Uh, you can see how the, the boxwood on the left there has the characteristic lesions. So the brown spot in the middle and the darker ring around it. These lesions often look a little wet. You can see the center picture there is what it does. Uh, it tends to defoliate the plants. They can, they can get to the point where they're just sticks really. And you can see on the, the picture on the right, you can see the lesions on the stems look a little different. There's streaks on the stems, but all of that is uh, characteristic of boxwood blight. This pathogen, uh, as I'm sure by now most of you are familiar with, is extremely transmissible. It is transmitted through water and through touch. So if you're working on an affected pro property and you don't sterilize between properties, you can very easily jump in between properties or even two nurseries if you go, you're going to pick up more stock and things like that. So it's something to keep in mind. You're going to want to sterilize any tools that uh, come in contact with it. You, you can do some Lysol works to kill it. Um, depending on the regulations in your area, you might be able to, to use a chlorine bucket where you just dip the tools in the chlorine. That'll also work. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, it's highly infectious. It's spread through touch and water. It's also spread through leaf litter. So the, those leaves, as they're dropping those leaves, those leaves will have spores in them and they can very easily transmit it to other plants in the area. As of now, I don't know of any cure for this. There are preventative treatments and please consult Cornell Cooperative Extension or licensed pesticide applicator for that. Uh, do not dispose of any boxwood plants that you believe are infected with boxwood blight in green waste recycling. The pathogen can survive, um, at least on the outside of mulch piles, uh, if not a little deeper in. And then that mulch is infectious and can be spread from property to property. 
Um, there were, we did find more cases of box of blight in 2020. It seems to, like as far as the intensity or the number of cases that we find, it seems to sort of go up and down from year to year. Uh, but it was again found in 2020, so please be on the lookout. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom for the invasive species law. Again, Mike, I apologize for jumping over too soon. I, I thought I was, I, sorry. Anyway. No worries, no worries. So, uh, I think we're all familiar, we should all be familiar with part 575. It's a it's a New York State DEC regulation, but the, uh, the plant part of it is enforced by New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. So it's a cooperative effort between the two state agencies. Um, there were 69 plants that were listed as prohibited. Most of them are not things found in the landscape, there's a few but most of the 69 plants are, are very common uh, weed species. Um, so don't let that scare you that there's 69 plants being removed from the nurseries. Um, there are six species of plants that are also regulated. Um, there are eight cultivars of those regulated pl plants that are, uh, that are exempt from regulation because they've been shown to be uh, non-propagative, uh, non-sexually propagative, um, and certainly not invasive. Uh, the list is currently under review by New York State DEC. It's a, it's a lengthy uh, multi-year process, but currently the, uh, the original listings were proposed in 2014. The law was enacted in 2015. Uh, enforcement really began in 17. Um, but it's, it's been a while since the original list was put forward in the legislation. That list is currently under review to uh, either add or, or or subtract plants. Uh, I believe there's only one plant that was requested to be removed. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but there's been there's a, a list of plants that have been proposed. Uh, there's no there's no final list, uh, but it's being discussed uh, and worked on by the, by New York State uh, DEC since their regulation. Uh, the prohibited plant species relevant to nursery setting. So what that means is basically the the plants that are on that on the uh, prohibited list cannot be moved, possessed, propagated, or, or planted. Um, but if a customer already has a plant in the ground, it, it's been grandfathered in. So it, you, don't, you don't have to be ripping plants out. At this point, any, any nursery stock that was existing, I'm sure, has, has been exhausted. Uh, but the, um, you know, the continuing of the propagation and sales of these prohibited plants uh, has uh, basically ceased. Uh, a special note for nurseries, the uh, Berberus thimbergii, you know, our friend the old Barberry, very common plant. There are a few exempt species uh, cultivars. Uh, those are the only ones that can be used in the nursery trade at this time. The only list, even if it's, you know, some, some suppliers will say, oh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's non-invasive or it's asexual. Unless it's on this list, it, 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 as far as New York State goes, it, it's not permissible. You know, it has to be on the exemption list. And currently, this is the entire list of, for Berberis. Lemon cutie and crimson cutie are starting to show up in the uh, in the trade the last two years, um, especially last year. Um, it was a kind of a bumper crop year for, for the nursery trade, although a lot of industries were hard hit. The, the landscape nursery industry, uh, you know, nursery sales and seed sales were uh, booming. Um, but lemon cutie and, and crimson cutie were uh, definitely available this year. I think they sold out quickly like many plants. So I think 2021, we may see more of these. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, lemon glow, I don't think I, I've had any, heard any reports of that being reported in the trade yet, but it is available. Uh, some of the other prohibited plants that are often common to the nursery setting are uh, sycamore maple, golden bamboo, and yellow groove bamboo. Not, not all the bamboos have been regulated, although many more have been, been proposed, uh, but currently these are the only two that are prohibited. There are also some local regulations by towns and other municipalities that prohibit planting different types of bamboo, but, but as a state agency, we, don't, we do not regulate that, we do not enforce that. Um, that's up to those uh, local entities. 
plants that are uh, prohibited in the in the Westchester area kind of overlap um, with some of the, uh, the the state regulations. Japanese knotweed, mile a minute, and giant hogweed uh, are three of the, the most notorious. The only one that you'd really find in the nursery trade intentionally would be the uh, occasionally would be the Japanese knotweed. Uh, there are some variegated varieties of that that have been uh, marketed. Uh, but they are also uh, prohibited. It says banned. Um, we didn't, that should have been corrected to, to prohibited plants. Sorry about the confusion, but it's prohibited. Um, just trying to keep the, the verbiage the same. Uh, mile a minute weed, um, if you're not familiar with that, it's got a, a triangular leaf, a little hook shape, shape uh, barb and it literally grows a mile a minute. It, it's, it grows voraciously and uh, will take over an area quite quickly. The, the most concerning one on the list is giant hogweed uh, because it has a human health risk. Um, there's a phytotoxicity to it. So you can touch the plant and then be exposed to sunlight and you can be permanently scarred and blistered uh, from the plant. Uh, the New York State DEC has a removal program so if you do find giant hogweed, um, it can be reported to the New York State DEC and can also be reported in IMAP Invasives, uh, which is a program run by the New York State Natural Heritage Program. Uh, so the prohibited plants, as I mentioned, there are 69 prohibited plants. Um, there are flyers or handouts available on part 575 for details for the entire list, or you can visit you know, in, in the uh, COVID age, in, in, in the uh, electronic age, you can visit the DEC uh, web link below for uh, more details on the entire list. Um, moving on to the regulated plants under Part 575. So these are regulated so that they're, they're considered invasive species in, in, in some parts of the states and some, some conditions, usually it's soil conditions. Um, the, the major thing here is these plants can still be sold if they're labeled properly, if the public is informed that, that they, they can be invasive and if they're not planted in, in, a, in a way such that they can escape into uh, natural lands. Um, so this includes cr Crimson King and qu Crimson Queen Norway maple, so the, the beautiful uh, burgundy leaf Norway maples that are sold in the nursery trade. They can be sold, they're not prohibited, uh, they just have to be properly labeled. Uh, as is burning bush, uh, you want several types of euonymus, several types of miscanthus, uh, and uh, Virginia uh, Japanese uh, virgin's bower, and also black locust. Um, some debate whether black locust should be regulated or not, but at least it's not prohibited. Um, that's one plant that was petitioned to be removed from regulation um, by the, the New York State uh, New York State. Uh, Forest Owners Association. Uh, so black locust uh, is currently on the list, but it's being looked at. Uh, so it may not remain on the uh, regulated list. It, it, it's totally up to the DEC. As I said, it's their regulation. Um, but black locust is being um, reevaluated. Um, as I mentioned, you know, yes, black, you know, uh, it, it is on the list. It, 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 some consider it native, you know, to New York, parts of New York. Um, historically, there's there's very little documentation uh, to show where it is and, and where it is not native. Uh, even the USDA, our federal partners, uh, depending on which part of the USDA you, you reference, uh, well, one agency within USDA listed as native to New York, others listed as, as introduced or invasive. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of controversy on whether it's, you know, an invasive in, in New York or not. Uh, it's particularly de destructive in, in a forest pet land, especially pine forests with sandy soils. It, it can very quickly colonize uh, sandy soils and outcompete Japanese, uh, you know, the young plantings of, uh, of pine. Uh, it's also been an, an issue for uh, Christmas tree growers where uh, some of the sandy soils there um, it, it can invade uh, those intentional crops, uh, but it can still be sold when properly labeled and not released uh, in a way that it's going to invade uh, natural areas. Uh, exemptions to the list, as I mentioned, um, there are miscanthus, other miscanthus that are exempt, My Fair Lady being one of them, and also Scout. Uh, My Fair Lady is pretty common in the, uh, in the trade. Um, 
as is uh, a couple of the, the Uwanimus. Uh, if But again, if these are not, these are the only ones that are not regulated, uh, all the other Miscanthus and Uwanimus must be properly labeled if they're not these specific cultivars. Uh, the la labeling requirements are, are spelled out in the law. Um, I won't get into it, but uh, this is basically the verbiage. Um, you know, the, the font type, the size, the, the type of labeling, the verbiage on the labeling, um, uh, it all has to be contained uh, as per the regulation. Um, plants should, should not be moved uh, from one location to another unless they're planted, unless they're tagged. Um, one important thing I want to mention is that the, the tag should be provided and, and placed on by the nursery growing the plant. So whether it's a New York State producer or an out-of-state producer, if you're if you're if you're cultivating the plant and you're propagating it, um, it needs to be labeled properly, or it needs to be shipped to New York with the proper labels. Uh, often, I get calls from from uh, you know folks in the trade saying that they don't have labels, and that, you know the uh, the providing the nursery that they bought them from is telling them it's not their you know not my job, and uh, it is their job. You know if they're shipping plants from other states to New York that are regulated. They have to meet the regulations. Um, not only do plants in New York State have to be regulated to identify the plant, they also have to be, right, you know, identified to regulate, identified to notify them that they're regulated as an invasive species. Um, here are some examples of the tags. They can be stickers, uh, as on the pot here on the right. And we're not trying to promote this particular big box store. It just was a good example of a, a stick-on label. But most of them are. On, you know, you can get the stick-on labels that attach to the uh, to the nursery labels, or you can have the standalone labels, um, like the center photo here. Um, often, these standalone labels, or the ones on the pot, are better because the uh, the other ones are often torn off um, during uh, during the retail process. Either someone's interested in the plant and they rip it off, they bring it to the counter to bring it up, or they rip the label off and bring it home to their you know their significant other and say, "Hey, this is the plant I want to buy." Uh, and you'll lose the invasive species regulation uh, label. Uh, we've had run into that issue in, in the past. So um, my preferred way is the uh, this one here in the center where it's a standalone label. You can see the nursery label in the background there. Um, but as long as it's labeled and the font size and, every, and the verbiage is consistent with the law, um, it, it's not a violation. But the, uh, the important thing is to stress that the, the nurseries providing the plants should be providing the labels, whether they're in state or out. Um, again, that's my first bullet point up here. Uh, labels are accepted in several forms as long as they meet the requirements. As I said, you know, my prefer, personal preferred one is the standalone label because they don't get ripped off. The one that sticks on the pot is pretty good too. Um, they must either be on the pot or attached to the plant. Uh, they can't be on the sign or on the counter or you know, be handed to the customer. Um, you know, they've got to be attached to the plant. Uh, you can make your own if you have to. If, if, if the, the, the supplying nursery didn't provide them, uh, you can produce your own. Uh, templates are available. Uh, but the labels must uh, be visible to the customers. They can't be hidden. And the instructions on them, uh, you know, they give ins instructions on, on how to plant them to avoid and actually you know, it's not just that it's invasive, it's also that, you know, where to, not to plant them in areas where they can become naturalized. When in doubt, just give your local horticulture inspector, you know, a call and, and they can just walk you through the process. It's much better than, than getting grief from a customer or, or uh, you know, running into a violation or, or having to correct a um, violation situation. So, and if you have any pushback from out-of-state nurseries, not providing the labels for invasive plants, call me. Uh, my contact information is later. Call me and, uh, and I'll work with them as I have in the past to, uh, to correct that issue. Uh, you know, it's their legal responsibility if they're gonna ship plants to New York. Um, so inf more information, detailed information about part 575 is available through the DEC. Um, it seems kind of awkward because it's you know, New York State Ag and Markets, it's a nursery thing, um, but the, the New York State DEC works in partnership with us through the Invasive Species Council or co-chairs. Um, and this regulation just ended up in their house. Um, but we enforce the plant side, they enforce the animal side. And it's a, it's a wonderful cooperative effort between the two of us. And it's been a very successful program. I was looking at some of the numbers recently. Um, 
we had three prohibited plant violations for the entire state of New York. Um, last year, we had uh, 3,512 horticulture and you know, nursery grower inspections conducted, uh, which isn't very far off from last year. Uh, and considering COVID and all the other restrictions that we had with moving staff around for spotted lanternfly, I think that's an absolutely stellar number uh, because you know our horticulture inspectors were out there doing their job inspecting nurseries and growers for, for plant diseases and pests, despite COVID, despite, you know, all the other challenges that they faced this year. Um, and there were, you know, minimal prohibited plant violations. And, uh, you know, there were, were 53 regulated plant um, issues. Uh, so, you know, of, of those 300, uh, sorry, 3,512, only 320 of those locations actually had um, material that's regulated by, by part 575. So, you know, when you look at just the, the, the nurseries that actually deal with it, um, they're being very compliant, very helpful, very supportive of this. Um, it's, it shows great, you know, uh, collaboration between, you know, state, federal, and, and local agencies, and also, um, you know, the, the, the nursery public, the nursery industry and the public. Um, we've gotten calls from the public, yeah, these plants aren't labeled, and sometimes they're exempt cultivars, sometimes they're not. Um, so, you know, the public does keep an eye on this as well, uh, but we prefer our horticulture inspectors to, to handle that, not the public. Um, and then, uh, so reporting invasive uh, insects, uh, you can always contact the uh, division email address. Uh, I'm one of the folks that review those. Uh, so you can send an email directly to the division and then it gets routed to the uh, to the, the right part of the division, the right person. Um, if you're going to report, report spotted lanternfly, uh, we have a new uh, email address here. So it's spotted lanternfly at agriculture.my.gov. And the new uh, hasn't even been officially rolled out yet. The new Asian longhorn beetle um, reporting address is Asian longhorn beetle at agriculture.my.gov. We tried to keep those consistent. Um, the older, uh, you know, stop ALB uh, phone number is still active and will remain active. Uh, but what's nice in the electronic age is with an email address, as Mike mentioned earlier, you can attach photos, GPS locations, you know, tree details. It was on the third limb up on the left, uh, you know, on the bottom side of the limb next to the, you know, knot hole, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, as much detail as you can. Uh, especially when reporting, reporting spotted lanternfly, um, it, it, it's greatly uh, appreciated and, and cuts down on uh, wasted time. Uh, you know, photos for Asian longhorn beetle, it's pretty easy to identify. Um, we often get lookalikes that are reported spotted lanternfly. We get occasionally get things that are reported that are lookalikes. Spotted lanternfly is, is pretty easy to identify in its juvenile and adult stages. The egg masses get a little uh, harder to identify because there are some other things like gypsy moth that look very similar. Uh, we've had some other pests like that have been reported. Uh, Asian giant hornet for one. Uh, we've had over 1,500 reports of Asian giant hornet. Not one of them were positive. They were all uh, lookalikes or, you know, people mistaking other things anywhere from hummingbirds to uh, mole crickets to, uh, you know, European hornets, uh, you know, there was a, a quite an array of things that people were reporting as an invasive species that were not. Um, so photos are always, always a, a huge help and uh, quicken that process uh, greatly. Uh, reporting other pests, as I mentioned, on residential properties and another resource is always Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, they're great. Their master gardener program is, is uh, phenomenal and uh, widespread throughout the state. Um, very well uh, staffed with many dedicated and uh, knowledgeable folks. Um, but, you know, if you suspect you have a spot of lantern fly, if you report it directly to us, uh, it kind of cuts out that step of reporting it to them, and then they, they turn it over to us. It's just a much quicker turnaround. Uh, but for most other pests, um, you know, except for those that I mentioned earlier about spotted lantern fly, Asian longhorn beetle, it's best to report those um, directly to the the reporting sites. Um, others, you can reach out to us or, or Cornell Crawford Extension um, and we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, Cornell Ex Crawford Extension might be best for some of the more common pests and we won't recommend any uh, pesticide treatments. We, we refer to you to Cornell Crawford Extension for that. 
uh, as they, they're more familiar with the local uh, requirements and codes and what would best work in your area of the state. Uh, any questions from Mike or I? So we should be able to hear anybody in the room if there are any questions. I just have a comment. Um, we did send the um, Ag and Markets flyers on Spotted Lanternfly um, over with Don earlier. Um, so please pick up a copy. It has the website and um, information of what to look for. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. And we appreciate it and, and reaching out to this, you know, really important audience. You guys are in the field all the time, you know, literally, literally waist deep in plants. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the um, egg masses are definitely a, a, a challenge to uh, ID for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even to locate because they like the, you know, the underside, you know, hidden areas, they're not like, Chips them off, but they'll just lay them on a, you know, any, any outside exposed surface. Uh, that SLF will always, you know, find an underside or a protected area if they can. Uh, but you know, sometimes they, those protected areas are taken up and they, they move on to you know second and third best areas. Yeah. Well, thank you for being there. And uh... So it doesn't sound like there's any question, but thank you both for coming and, and taking the time to speak about this. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Of course.